Well, good morning and uh, welcome. We're going to begin with the word of prayer. <clears throat> the dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful once again for all of your blessings that you provide to us to us each day and for the fellowship and friendship that we can have as we study your word together we invite your spirit uh, to unite our hearts and our minds and we pray lord that um, as we are connected with you um, that um, you can use us uh, to your glory Help us to understand the topic this morning and to give us a, a patience and a character uh, that can be uh, used by you. Bless each person. May you help them in their personal struggles in life. And may these truths uh, bring a conviction and a power. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to shut this window and get a bit of noise in. So, <clears throat> so what we've been doing over the last couple of days is laying out these lines. And, and some of the main things, which I, which I asked about yesterday, what, what it is that we, we are learning about the lines that's being hard to unlearn. And, and what would that be? What is it that um, Parminder developed regarding the lines that we're having a hard time uh, in this movement removing that, that the influence that Parminder had? And I mean, it's a bit more of a complicated question uh, if we talk about the influence, but specifically in regard to the lines, can somebody explain what that is? You mean beside looking at the way that he was corrupting the lines and corrupting the use of the lines? Well, yeah, but how, how, what, what is this basic principle? Like, I mean, I've explained it, but I don't know if, if everybody's really clear exactly what he did. What is the principle behind his corruption of the lines? Because it's actually a fundamental principle that he transgressed in the way that he constructed the lines. It wasn't just a difference of opinion about how to place the way marks. I don't know if people understand because the, the one point that he talked about was that way marks cannot typify other way marks, right? That was a statement that he made that Jeff just accepted or at least appeared to accept. But what was the principle that was being transgressed when he said that? It's a fundamental principle of this movement. That figures can have more than one application. Okay, so it's part of that. So it, that means we know that the way marks are types, right? Correct. So if you say that a way, one way mark can't typify the next way mark, you're actually denying the whole principle of the repeat of history. Isn't that what you're doing in doing that? That's, that is a good way of looking at it. Yeah, so, because we take a story in the Bible and we look at this story figuratively. And and, and basically, when he made that statement regarding about the way marks can't typify other way marks, you could just, you could easily just say, well, that can't be true unless stories are not typical, because a way mark is a story, right? It, it's telling a story. It's, it's illustrating the everlasting gospel. And, and so we found as we went through these lines that when we zoom into a way mark, it is a reform line. And so if it's a reform line and every way mark is a reform line, then every way mark has to simplify every other way mark. And, and Jeff actually built the movement upon that foundation 
and and to just set it aside because Parminder made this claim with no support, like there was no not even an argument of how he came to that conclusion. From what I remember, it was just basically a statement that we can't do this. And and yet Jeff accepted it, or at least appeared to, whether he really accepted it or he just wasn't going to fight that battle at that time. I don't know, but we can see that what we're doing right now, when we're looking at the story of judges and we're, we're, we're trying to understand these lines, as we look at this being Parminder, uh, the message here, um, the, or the, the enemy, then the message that's in response to that is actually an establishment of the principle that Parminder is transgressing. I don't know if, 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 if I've said that clearly. Well, the one, the one thing that I thought was coming very direct, when you observe Parminder's presentations, not, not trying to take them as, as the words of a true representative of God, yeah. But when you when you step back from this, you find that there's just enough truth mixed with error to want to make people question why he's going where he's going. Right. Well, now, the the rest of it, some of some of what Parminder was saying, especially the way that he was presenting it was so matter of fact that many didn't jump to defend what the positions that had been taken in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's especially true with this with Elder Jeff. Yeah. No, so uh, back in 2018 and even in 2017 when I was there, and so these are both in September. Um, and Parminder was presenting. You know, he often, if, if I had a comment, he would just say, well, you know, let's not discuss that right now. Or don't bring this up. Because he, he knew where I would be going. But he was presenting in such a way that it was more, the, a lot of these questions, and of course you don't know the conclusions that he's drawing. So he's kind of letting you draw your own conclusions. But if, if for me, I was starting with, well, he's trying to get us to examine something. So he's sort of tearing it apart, um, but he's going to put it back together, right? And, and the way that I think about it is if, if you've ever read a lot of A.T. Jones, A.T. Jones does this. He says some things at the beginning of his presentations that, that seem a little bit shocking at first because he's trying to get you to examine something. But he does always put it back together, right? He, he, he gets you to question your own thinking about something so that you can examine it. It's more an analytical type of teaching. And Parminder seemed to be doing that, but he wasn't, he wasn't coming back to the truth. And he would use some things that are actually... Uh, that were quite compelling because he would notice some details in the spirit of prophecy or in a scripture that that actually, if he had the truth behind him, would have been quite powerful. But because he he had was going this different direction, you couldn't tell that. It and and it took me a while, like even when I noticed that he, you know, when he said you can't have one waymark typify another waymark, and I understood what that meant. Like I understood the implications of it, but I just couldn't accept that Parminder was actually knowing what he was doing by what he was saying. That is, I didn't think he would actually come to the conclusions that he did based upon that. But so, you know, there's this way that he drew the lines where he had them staggered. Now, Jeff kind of started that, but Parminder had developed it to the point that it was the lines weren't 
comparable to anything in Millerite history. And if we're repeating Millerite history, our lines should look the same. And so he had constructed these new lines. And a lot of the things that he had accused uh, Chawatu of doing with 9-11, Arminder had done even more to destroy it. So this was, uh, you know, I mean, it was a very subtle attack on the message in some ways. But in some ways, it was an open assault. It's just we didn't notice it because of how he had approached it. And the trust that we put in Parminder because of Jeff's trust in Parminder. Like, if Jeff hadn't trusted Parminder, I don't think anybody or very few people would have listened to him. But, you know, he was now, you know, the guy organizing the movement, and he had this authority, and he used it. And the other thing that he did in 2018, it was his first presentation. He talked about how, you know, we used to study together as a group and try to come to understand truth, and now we just have somebody up front speaking and sharing uh, without, without real study, right? That is, we're just accepting what the person says. And, and that was sort of a, a bit of a, um, a smokescreen for what he was actually doing. So he would talk against what he was doing, but he would do it. And because I think he realized by sort of acting in a certain way, he could actually go ahead and do the thing that, that he said he, that we shouldn't do. So I don't know. It was, the point here, I guess, is that when we're looking at Judges chapter four, and when we look at Judges chapter five, and we look at Parbinder's message, He's definitely an enemy, and the result, the, 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 the judge, the message that counteracts Parminder, establishes the foundation of this movement. And, and that's why July 18th, if people remember, um, you know, Jeff did some presentations where he said, Everything that this movement has studied, everything that we have been about, has led to this prediction. It's the logical conclusion. And, and Jeff could see this clearer than anyone. That everything that he had studied, everything that he had done, had all led to this prediction. And, and that's why he supported it. Because it just made too much sense. And so now when, when it failed, of course, it doesn't mean that our understanding was incorrect. Because as we saw, if we're repeating Millerite history, then we have to have that experience. We have to uh, repeat the experience of the Millerites. And, and we see that since July 18th, we're experiencing what happened after October 22nd, 1844. So now when we put this on a line, when we take Judges 4, we're saying that either 2014 or 2012, however you want to, you want to look at it, it's not necessarily that important about the date. Um, because you could either go seven years from 2014 to 2021, or you could go from 2012 to 2019. And maybe um, a both are sort of true. Parminder as a person from 2012 to 2019, uh, 19 is that seven years in which Parminder becomes this, um, his message on time setting, and then him as a person, his movement splits with the movement. But from 2014, his prediction date to 2021 is also seven years. So maybe it's, it's this sort of staggered two periods of seven years that illustrate two different aspects of uh, the message. I don't know if that makes sense to people. Now, when, when we started drawing these things on a line, um, the other point that we need to think about again is 
what line are we? What what line is FFA? So, you know, I suggested that maybe we're a zoom in on 9-11 itself. Or are we, are there two different zoom ins, two different lines that are overlapped? One that we would call FFA, that's a zoom in to the 9-11 way mark. And then that this movement presently is a zoom in to the midnight way mark. Do people understand what I'm saying? Anybody with questions on that? Why don't you repeat what you just said? Okay, so I'm going to draw it on the board. So just. Uh... Can you hear me okay? You're coming through all right. Okay. It's just, I like using this microphone on the camera when I'm up here. Um, so we have these lines that, we, that, that start, I'm going to put all of them here, 1989, um, 1996, 911, 911. You're, you're still okay, sharing. Still got you, you, oh, I still got the screen share. Sorry about yeah. that. Do that. Okay, there we go. So you can see we got these different waymarks. So that's the arrival of the first angel, its formalization, its empowerment. This is the arrival of the second angel. And then we have midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. Right? So these are our seven waymarks. Now, of course, 9 11 has two different purposes. So it does, it's not two different 9-11s. They don't happen at different times. But they represent, um, depending where we are in a line, they represent different waymarks. So this can represent, uh, it can parallel August 11th, 1840, but it can also parallel April 19th, right? So if we put above here 1798, 1833, August 11th, 1840, April 19th, 1844, right? And then, of course, July 21st, um, August 15th, and October 22, right? So this part of the line here, this is what Jeff had understood by 2016, right? So we had this uh, Midnight, Midnight Cry Sunday Law, and we had looked at earlier how he had had this broader line that basically was a time at the end, the Sunday law, the close of probation, right? And, and as time went on, we kept zooming in uh, to this. So the question is, is, is this movement a zoom in to 9-11, either one of these 9-11s that is in a different context, or is it a zoom into midnight? That is, we have a reform line that this movement is a part of right now. And the question is, what reform line are we experiencing? That's, that's what we're trying to decide. Now, I know this confuses people, these two different 9-11s. But th Jeff, this 9-11, August 11th, 1840, when did he come to realize that 9-11 uh, paralleled August 11th, 1840, when we went through examining the foundation? When did he come to understand this? Because he obviously didn't know it before 9-11, because he had August 11, 1840 back here at the time of the end. Wasn't it like in 2015? No, it was after 9-11. Now, they came to understand the 25-21st. Which was 2005. Yeah. Um, and so I'm trying to remember exactly how that unfolded. But I, I think it would have been, because it's happening gradually. So, I mean, that question of how he came to understand it. It, it was in connection with understanding the 2520 as well, but it still took Jeff time to, 
to develop this understanding. Now, um, it was, um, uh, what's his name? Because in the 2004 meetings, um, Russell. Uh, Russell Standish? No, no, no. No, not Russell Standish. It was um, a guy in the movement. Um, is it Russell? Can't think of his name. Anyway, he's the one who really sort of developed the idea. But so you can say in 2004, they start to get this idea that 9-11 is connected with August 11th, 1840s. So we could maybe say that. Um, that's when it's starting. But it, it, it gets established, I think, by 2007 that Jeff fully understands that. Now, as far as April 19th lining up with 9-11, so that's going to happen when? When does Jeff now connect um, the first day of the first month to 9-11? How does that happen? And, and one of the things I think that Chowatu brought out that was correct is that this is sunset. And, and, and Chowatu puts this as 2014 as well. But, but I need to explain that a little bit. Yeah, I think I would. Okay. So when we look at this way mark, in Millerite history, this is sunset, correct? April 19th. Because if this is midnight and this is morning, then this has to be sunset. Okay. Right? In the, in the progression, that would be correct. Now, but 9-11 isn't sunset. Um, if you're in a different line, that is, if you're choosing treating 9-11 differently, that is, if 9-11 is August 11th, 1840, then and only then is sunset 2014. That is, if this is 2001 and 2001 is lining up with this, then you could line up April 19th with 2014 but you're in a different line. And this is where this movement has had problems is that we, we don't recognize that when we zoom into a way mark, we have a reform line and that reform line will connect with other way marks from other reform lines. But it doesn't mean that you would abandon the idea that April 19th lines up with 9-11. When you do that, you're not going to line up 2014 with 9-11 because those are different times, right? So you only do that if August 11th, 1840 lines up with 9-11. Does that make sense to people? That is, if you're in a reform line where you're lining up 9-11 with August 11th, 1840, then 2014 lines up with April 19th. And that's completely uh, correct. That is, 2014 is sunset if August 11th, 1840 is 9 11. Because 9 11, even though it represents two different uh, waymarks for Millerite history, it only does so because you have two different reform lines in which 9-11 occurs. Does, does that make sense to people? That's an interesting point. Okay, because we saw this when we were dealing with Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We could have a reform line, that's Abraham's reform line, and Abraham's reform line had events from the life of Isaac that were waymarks in Abraham's reform line. But in Isaac's reform line, those same waymarks 
served a different purpose. So, and this is, this may be a very odd thought. Yeah. Is 161 a symbol of sunset? 161? Explain. On the chart, we have 158 being the year, 158 BC being the year that the, the Jews entered their league with Rome. But we've also accepted that 161 was the beginning of that time period. Other way, ar- other way around, flip that. Other way around. So, well, if 161 sunset. What I'm, what I'm asking, I'm asking that in relation to August 11th, 1840. But see, I would still put them this way. I would put them backwards as a mirror. Okay, because what I what I'm looking at with that is that the August 11th, 1840, when we progress, of course, one 161 years, we will come to September 11, 2001. Yeah, so you're saying from so so you would do it this way, 161 here. Correct. And that's because it's 161 years, uh, 2001 minus 1840 equals 161 correct okay so, so is, this is 158 well considering that this was the um jewish this this would have been the end of the jewish year for 1843 yes Okay. Because if you added the 1843 to the 158, you'd again come to 2001. Yeah. Okay. So maybe both of these show up uh, just as 911 as a symbol. Correct. This 911. So in that context, that this isn't 2014, then. No, I'm just. This is just a 9-11, that 9-11 serves two different purposes. Correct. Just like the league has these two different dates, 9-11. Correct. Okay, I think you're correct. And that fits in with what, what we're, we're understanding here. Now, it's a little difficult. I mean, that is, we need to specifically identify which line it is that has 9-11 as August 11th, 1840. And which line it is that has April 19th lining up with 9-11. Because those are two different reform lines that are overlapped that our movement is connected to. And, and I think that should make sense to people based upon what we understood in the lines in, in our other studies. But we have never really defined this. That is, we have this this idea of um, the priests, the Levites, the Nephilim, and and we have Parminder's staggering of those lines. But I don't think that that's really what we should be looking for, because we don't see the priests, Levites, and Nephilim in Millerite history. But we do see reform lines that occur. Samuel Snow's letters is is a reform line. Miller has his own reform line. And his reform line is going to end at the end of the Jewish year, 1843. Right? For Miller, his reform line is not going to go past his prediction. If you, if we were applying something that was written about Father Miller. Okay. And I'm looking at um, ESH 22.6. Yeah. Okay. In relation to the 2014, can this be applied? Okay. By By this league made 158 years before Christ, the Roman kingdom became 
connected with the people of God and having worked deceitfully, soon obtained the power to trample on, break in pieces, and devour the Jews. Can we make that application in relation to the time period where Parmender was introducing all of these, these other fallacious ideas? Yes. That, that's where we, we, we definitely have to make that parallel there. So we're recognizing the fact that 2001, September 11, 2001, yeah. with the symbol of 161, was the symbol of the corporate church accepting spiritual formation. And the symbol of 158 is the symbol of the movement accepting the results of spiritual formation by the teachings of Parmender. Yes. Okay. So, so we got 13 years here, right? Between these two. Right. If we look at it that way, we have three down here. So, so both of these can, can represent the threefold enemy, right? And rebellion. Okay. I don't know. Maybe there's some other way to understand the three, but I see those as parallel to each other. I wouldn't disagree. Okay. Now, so then, uh, even when we look at Miller, I mean, when does, I mean, technically Miller would end on April 18th at sunset, even though he originally had March 21st. He's still going to accept the modifications of the calendar that the Jewish year ends on April 19th. Right? Okay. Right, even right. though he's, he's not fully involved in that discussion, but he still sort of accepts that. And it's going to be on May 2nd, um, 1844, that he's going to have his first apology in defense. He has another one later um, that's published on August 1st, 1845. But the, one, the first one in 1844 um, is because his prediction has failed. And it's not called an apology in defense. I can't remember the title of it, but it's in our Three Angels Messages source book. So, so we have this sort of failure of Miller's prediction, but Miller still continues. Um, and I'm not sure how to make that parallel exactly. So that's one of the things we have to figure out. But, but if we look at Jeff and his movement, it would have to be a zoom in on 9-11, but it would have to be a zoom in on this 9-11. Agreed. Okay. <laughs> but this 9-11 here is, is the end of Jeff's line. So, so I still don't know really how to construct the lines. I wish I knew how to do that. Um, but the one thing that we can say is that the movement now is either a zoom in on this 9-11, which, which I would, would tend to uh, focus upon. That is, there's Samuel Snow's letters part of the movement. Now, Jeff participates in that. So as a person, Jeff is a part of this. But and how that how that fits in where we are in the lines that's what i'm not certain about but what i can say is that when we look at this line and the repeat of millerite history the parable of the ten virgins i don't think we're to midnight yet that is we may have overlapped with some of these waymarks going forward but we're still really involved in 
understanding this way mark. It is, it's an unfolding of this way mark. But it could be that we are now moving into this way mark, that the movement has these different reform lines. And as we've passed through history, we've now moved into a zoom in on another reform line. That is, we've entered into another way mark and we have a reform line in that way mark. Now, I don't know how we can construct this completely. But if we if we're going to take what we have said about these judges, these judges are going to be occurring in this movement from 2001 all the way up till based on chapter 2, 2023. That is, they're going to be involved there. All of these judges that we're going to look at are going to be illustrating this history. Um, now, I'm just going to put this here as 2023. Now, I'm not saying that 2023 is we're going to have midnight necessarily, but as far as a symbol that we have this period here of 22 years that, that I believe that marks the period of the judges as a symbol. Does this make sense? Anybody have comment? This, this could be wrong, but if we take Judges chapter two, it's gonna take us from 2001 to 2023 Okay, what we're looking at here, especially with the introduction of a, a period of 22 years, yeah, is a time period of renewal and restoration, right? Yeah. Does that apply to the corporate church? I'm I'm going to yeah, say no. no. I, I don't think the corporate church ever will be restored right that's that's the point that i'm getting at so in yeah. other words what the period of 2001 to 2023 is a message it's a symbol to the movement itself right now in that we have this interrelation then with the 161 and the 158. I'm not disagreeing with you because with this with the 911 of April 19th 1844 and 2014 I don't believe that we have yet come to midnight. No. However, no. is it possible that the line from 2001 to 2023 as it relates to the to the corporate church where they've accepted spiritual formation that 2023 is their midnight or their shut door okay no so i, I followed you for a bit there but this is a close of probation here for the corporate church. I agree. And, but... and, and, what, and what 2014 is, is it's midnight in a line. That is, right. 2014 is midnight. That's what I just said. Okay, but it's not to do with the corporate church is what I'm trying to say. Okay, why? Because it has to do with this movement. This is all about this movement. The corporate church has nothing to do with any of this after 2001. Okay. The, the foolish and the wise virgins. Yeah. They are together. I mean, if, if we were to look at this, that the foolish and the wise virgins are together as of August 11th, 1840. Okay, so yeah, so August 11th, 1840, the foolish and the wise are together. 
but are the foolish and the wise virgins yet together as of 2014? Okay. So have they not have they not been all of them asleep? Given yeah, so through the, yeah, so the foolish and wise are together. So this is this movement from 9-11 to the Sunday law. Got it. Now, if you look at a reform line, one of the things that you will find is that midnight represents the Sunday law. Right. Every way Mark typifies everything else. So when Jeff draws the line like this and he talks about the Sunday law, he's talking about the Sunday law on the big line. That's what he always was doing. But one of the things that we found is if we took this as this movement, we this is 9-11, this is 2001, and this is the Sunday law that Parminder predicted. Midnight. He predicted midnight, and he was correct. Now, then we're going to have a midnight cry and a Sunday law. Now, we would put the midnight cry in this context as 2018. That's October 13th, 2018. And the Sunday law here in this context is November 9th, 2019. So this relates to the movement in its connection with Parminder. So this is a reform line that you could develop going from 9-11 to November 9th, 2019. But we're past November 9th, 2019, because we continue to have symbols occur in our movement that are midnight. So we also have midnight is going to be January 6th. Uh, 2021. That's also going to be midnight. And the midnight cry is then going to be connected because this is raphia, paneum. This is going to be this November uh, 8th, uh, 2022 election. And then you're going to have the Sunday law, which is going to be January 11th, 2023. So we, we can see that we can construct different lines, but 9-11 is at the beginning of these lines. That is, we don't stagger this over. We don't move 9-11 here in this case to some other, other way mark. Now, this is the problem, is these wheels within wheels, they're very complex, but we have marked different events as midnight and different events as the midnight cry. We all could, so can construct one where this is November 9th and this is July 18th and this is December 25th, 2021, right? Because we've constructed that line. So what, what people will try to do is say, well, one line is right and one line is wrong, right? That is when we, we don't have what we expect, we just say, well, that line was incorrect. But we can't do that, can we? Because these are all correct lines. They're just illustrating the same thing from different events. Isn't that allowed? Yes. OK. So when we're looking at a line like what we're presently in, this is where I think that we are. We're, we're illustrating something in this movement right now that can be illustrated um, by these predictions that have been made. Just like these predictions that have been made in the past all create these lines. And that, and that these are typical and that there's different, that there, we're on different way marks. That is, we're zoomed into a different way mark. When we when we do that, and sometimes we have a zoom in to a way mark that is actually on a reform line that is a zoom into a reform that reform line is zooming in to a way mark above it, which is what I think we're having happening here with this particular one is we're just zooming into 
one of these way marks. And so, so we have to decide. And, and the way that I would look at this is what we're in right now is 2014 is a way mark, and that has a reform line. And one of those way marks in that reform line is this reform line that ends in 2023. So, so we're we're just moving down in or in scale. We're changing in scale when we deal with 2023. But you can see that this isn't always that helpful because we don't really know yet how these lines should be constructed. <clears throat> but what we can say is that uh, the period of the judges has to be in this history for us right now. What we're studying is we're studying this history because this is the history we're in right now. And this is what God is trying to get us to understand so that we know how to relate to what is happening. So that as things unfold, we can see God's leading and we can continue to walk in the light that he has given us. If we fail to understand this, the only way that we can fail to understand this is if we reject the light of the midnight cry that has been shining all along the path. And, and that's the danger, is that people continue to reject the light of the midnight cry. That is, they reject God's leading in the past, saying that God wasn't leading us in what we did. And if you believe that, then you can't use that light for your feet, and you will go off the path, path and fall into the dark, wicked world below. Correct? All right. Agreed. So that's what we're trying to, to understand right now. Now, we know that people fell off the path because the enemies came in and they were conquered by those enemies. They were being oppressed. So Parminder is one of those enemies. And he's presently, I think, the primary enemy that we're still addressing. That is, his message had done so much to undermine Jeff's message especially in its opposition to July 18th, which Jeff said everything in our movement had pointed to July 18th and Parminder rejected it. And the only way he could get people to reject it was to lay a foundation of a false system of study and a false system of authority so that he could just tell people July 18th is an error. But we know that it can't be an error if God was leading us. And, and, and we know if we trace it all back, we would have to reject everything that God has shown, not just this movement, but Adventism. We'd have to reject the spirit of prophecy. And if we do that, we continue to go back, we would have to reject Christianity itself. Because the same principles, that light that comes from the cross, is the light that really is the light of the midnight cry. And so, so here in this movement, we're in a crisis because we always have voices that, tell, uh, that are telling us that in order to preserve what we have, we have to follow certain things, that we have to believe certain things. But when they actually reject the principles, the foundation upon which the message has been established, it doesn't matter what they say. We have to understand for ourselves that these principles can't be rejected. They have to be continually followed, that the light of the past, past has to be established. It has to guide us. And, and what we're seeing right now is a rejection of that light. And, it, and it's a subtle rejection in some ways, because it always makes a profession of believing that light. And we saw this in early writings, page 74. The people who were time setting, the people who were going to old Jerusalem, were trying to retain the Millerite message 
while rejecting the very principles upon which it was founded. Does that help anyone? <clears throat> it's adding more to the to what we've been addressing. Okay. So now we're looking again at Judges chapter four. And we can establish that Jabin represents the papal system of study and Cicero, the apostate Protestant system of study that's introduced into this message by Parminder. Can we agree with that? Is that what we understood? That's what was being addressed yesterday. Okay, yeah. And um, and then we had the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots. And I, I don't think we've really addressed this 900 yet. Um, chariots of iron, why it's the ni number 900. We did address the tw 20 years. So we can see that that's uh, a period of time in this movement from 9-11 to 2001. So, and any thoughts about the 900 chariots, as far as the number 900? Does 900 represent something? It has to represent something. There's a reason for it to be recorded. Yeah, okay. Now, the number nine itself, um, it, it's related to a Strong's, Strong's says, to gaze at or about properly for help by implication to inspect, um, consider, it means compassionate, be nonplussed as looking around in an amazement or bewildered. Um, so it's kind of interesting that we have in this case, uh, the children of Israel are crying unto the Lord because of these 900 chariots of iron. Now, um, uh, we got the word chariot, we have the word iron, which we've looked into. So, so how would we then understand this 900? What is it representing? In this movement. Well, the 900 chariots would represent a force that comes against the movement, but then is taken by the movement. So it's, a, you know, how we're going to interpret this is going to be kind of important. Yeah, yeah. So, so we can say that if we look at how Parminder came in, uh, we could take some of these adjectives that are attached with the meaning of the word nine. Um, considering to be nonplussed, looking around in amazement or bewildered. Um, definitely that idea uh, could be seen by Parminder's presentations as we've characterized them. Right. I mean, he really caused a lot of confusion in the movement while he's trying to so-called clarify and and defend 9-11, for instance. So that was the amazing thing to me, is how he attacked people for destroying the 9-11 while he was destroying it himself as a symbol. So it, it would relate to how Parminder how this enemy 
how its message is affecting the movement. So we've had this enemy in the movement since 9-11. And, and, and it's something that we, we, it was an enemy that wasn't destroyed, right? Even though there was an attack against this enemy and, and the first King Jabin was killed, but the enemy wasn't removed. So is Parminder, as Dwight is saying, uh, teaching spiritual formation or using spiritual formation, which is really just an extension it's it's more a papal form of neurolinguistic programming, which neurolinguistic programming is more a scientific, or um, the dragon powers form of manipulation. Is that is that partly the enemy then this spiritual formation from that the church accepts in nine eleven, that it still exists in this movement. Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm going to show you an article. Um, this is from Ministry Magazine. And, and I've referred to this a number of times, but um, you can see here, this is Ministry Magazine. Oh, they updated their web page. It looks a little fancier. And um, this is this is from um, March of 2000. So this is prior to. Um, and I'm just going to download this PDF here, so I can send this out to everyone. Okay. So if we look at this uh, magazine article. Let me see if I can get to the article itself. Okay, it has an article in here about building the ideal Sabbath school. Now, of course, these things are really going to um, go against the principles set out in the spirit of prophecy. But anyway, that's a whole other story, I guess. Um, okay, this is the article, The Spiritual Formation of Children. Now, if you read through this article, what they're basically asking you to do, and it doesn't show up properly. How come it doesn't show up? Oh, I know why. You can't see this. Uh, here, i got to move here, so... have to stay on this. I opened up the PDF and you can't see that. So here we are. Spiritual formation of children. So if you read this artic article, one of the things they talk about is a unified curriculum. And um, I'll just zoom into this. A unified church curriculum that emphasizes the infusion of religious language into the lives of the congregation provides a valuable tool for spiritual formation in children and parents. The central elements of such a curriculum are religious language and Bible stories. Religious language is an important tool for building faith. By religious language, I mean words and concepts that Christians throughout history have drawn from Bible stories. Words such as in incarnation, idolatry, salvation, grace, antichrist, commandment, redemption, etc. These words conceptualize our faith Taken together, the words that compromise a religious language create a kind of methodology of faith. So what, what's being said here? Any, can anybody summarize what, what she's saying in this article? Now, 
Notice this is Denise A. Ropka Kasichi is a children's ministry consultant in Nashville, Tennessee, by the way. Does anybody know what she's saying? I would have to take a few more minutes to read this to really give an opinion. Okay, so so when you're dealing with religious language, these terms, you want people to, um, and it's part of spiritual formation, is the idea that you can you can sort of create a Christian from the outside in. Well, <clears throat> looking at this, this is almost all almost like the the attitude that had been expressed within the catholic church you give a child to the church until they're seven that they would remain a catholic for life right and and all that's required is that a person on the outside conform to something to a culture right adventism has a culture and if you're just fit into that culture you, you live this certain life, you talk a certain way, you eat certain foods, you do certain things, certain kinds of jobs, and you come together at church, you create this community, and that makes you a Christian, right? That's the way the church has worked, because the church has worked from the outside of the person. They, they don't know what to do about the heart because that would require the gospel. So instead, you can make people appear to be Christian. That is, they're, they're, they're just dressed up in Christ, Christian garb. So you go to an Adventist house. They'll have, you know, you go to their door. They'll have a Bible verse on the door. Um, you know, they might have a, a mat where you wipe your feet. It's got a Bible verse or some kind of Christian saying. You go in, they have... Uh, the pictures that you can buy at the ABC, the little, uh, you know, whatever's going to be on their fridge is going to be things that you can tell they're a Seventh-day Adventist. You look at the books in their bookshelf and you'll know they're Seventh-day Adventist. And, and they will go to church and they have all the trappings of Adventism. But are they converted? No, they're not, right? No. But do they think they're converted? Unfortunately, yes. And that's because you have brainwashed them into thinking that what they're doing is going to save them. Now, they don't believe, of course, in overcoming sin, and they don't have Christian conversation, really, except maybe they might consider it Christian conversation to sort of criticize other people who aren't like them. Right? That to them is their Christian conversation. But they aren't Christians, but they can dress up as Christians. And that's what spiritual formation does. Yeah, so they think that talking about things makes somebody a Christian. Now, they also talk about a unified curriculum. So what they want to have is a unified church curriculum based upon the seasons of the year. That is, framing a unified curriculum can be accomplished in two basic ways. The first is the use of a church calendar. The second is to follow the themes outlined in the Seventh-day Adventist children's curriculum. Now, could you imagine if, if you had a church where, and this is what they want you to have, is that the children's Sabbath school and the adult Sabbath school and the sermons preached from the pulpit are always going to be unified every Sabbath. What does this sound like? Based upon the church calendar and the, and the, the events of the life of Christ, etc. They say the traditional Christian calendar provides a convenient and theologically sound model, beginning with the birth of Christ, continuing through Pentecost, and concluding with the birth of the church. What, what does this sound like to you, Angela? Uh, I am really being triggered right now. It sounds a lot like what was pounded into me in Catholic school. This is right. really hard for me. 
Okay, sorry about that. But yeah, this no, is no, I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm watching myself react, and I'm okay. thinking, wow, it's still affecting me. I mean, I'm glad it's being exposed. We yeah. need to realize this. I, I, I want to read this article and really, you know, start recalling stuff and saying, yeah, the church has been papalized. Right, and the and the church has been doing this in a progressive manner. Because once yes, you I realize that, and that's one of the main reasons why I I am so filled with revulsion. It would be extremely hard for me to set foot in a purportedly Adventist church at this point. I, I mean, it's been going on for years. Yeah, now, and, and it all sounds fine. I, re I remember going to uh, another Adventist church, um, a large Adventist church, uh, one Sabbath and uh, sitting in a, a very large Sabbath school. I mean, it was must have been about 20, 30 people there. Um, and they had lots of, because it's a church of like a few hundred people, I don't know, 400 people or something. So obviously you have to go on all these separate Sabbath school rooms. Um, and somebody was visiting from another place and, and they started talking about how it's so nice that I can go anywhere in the world and I can I can feel comfortable in a Sabbath school because it's the same Sabbath school les lesson. It's the same culture. And and of course, you know me, I, I, I oppose this and I said, well, the root of the word culture is cult. And I don't think that it's something we should be proud of as Seventh day Adventists that we're conforming to some kind of external um example of what it means to be a seventh day adventist because it doesn't mean that we're converted and and of course people weren't very happy with me but um but that's the view that i have you know i became an adventist i don't like adventist culture i think it's cheesy um and i don't think it's helpful uh, for people recognizing their sinful condition. It's mostly a cloak for sin. So, so this is a problem that we see that's creeped into Adventism over time. And, and this idea of spiritual formation, whichever we go here. Um, so people could probably read this, but what we're seeing is that if you look at this model, of what the church was doing, Parminder was basically trying to set up a copy of the Adventist church, which really, really was just a copy of the papacy. Uh, can we agree with that? I would say we would have to agree with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been to various so-called Protestant churches, and they're basically doing the same thing. I mean, the infiltration is so heavy. Yeah. Well, but it's not even just infiltration. It's just human nature, right? Human nature avoids the light and seeks darkness rather than light. Human nature tries to cover up its sin. Human nature is involved in gossip tearing other people down so that you don't have to face who you are. Everything about the gospel, everything about God is contrary to our nature. But when we set up a system that actually appeals to our nature, that makes us feel secure, that makes us believe that we're better than other people, that it's somehow, I'm not like this publican, you know, I fast twice in the week and I give tithes of all that I possess. So I must be a good person. I, I'm opposed to um, what's happening in the world today. So I must be a good person. That doesn't mean anything. The question is, do I act like Christ? Doesn't matter what I profess. It doesn't matter what group I belong to or what kind of recognition I have from other people or even just acceptance of other people. That doesn't make me a Christian. The only thing that makes me a Christian is if I'm Christ-like. 
And if I look at myself honestly, we would have to all say we're not Christ-like. We haven't been converted. God has give, been giving us light, drawing us out of this darkness, and we have been responding, and that's good. But that's not the end of the process. And so we can't commend ourselves. We can't, we can't pat ourselves on the back. Just because we're studying this thing and we can recognize, you know, Parminder was an error. But if we're doing exactly the same things as Parminder, but maybe in a different, a different way, but we're still doing basically operating on the same principles, then we're no better than Parminder. That enemy, ha the, the place that that enemy is destroyed is inside each one of us. We're being oppressed by ideas. And this movement is infected with an illness. And we're, we're, we don't want to accept it. <clears throat> so this 900 chariots of iron And, and iron itself, um, it comes from a, a word, a root, apparently meaning to pierce or holes, right? And um, chariots, I mean, we know what a chariot is, and it's also a symbol of war. So, and, and, and it also has to do with the giving of a message as well, to dispatch. And and then, of course, we have 100, which is um, a multi multiplicative and a fraction. also can represent six score, which is 120. Um, and then nine, which this number representing uh, this idea of to expect, inspect or gaze at or about, but also to be nonplussed as looking around in amazement. So, so what has Parminder's message done? If we're gonna be a bit more concrete about this, how, how do we defeat this enemy? So we have this, this message of Parminder's. And we have Deborah, a prophetess. And, and, and we had some discussion about what she would represent. Because a woman can represent a church. But I would think that this would represent a message uh, that, that comes from the spirit of prophecy. And, and one of the reasons is uh, uh, Lapidoth. She's the wife of Lapidoth. And Lapidoth means torches or a flame or a lamp, uh, a firebrand, burning lamp, a lightning, a torch. And what does Ellen White's name mean? And what does Ellen mean? Light. Bright and shining lamp. Yeah, when I, when I, I, I had remarked a way back when I thought that, 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 that this was a representative of yeah. Ellen White. Right, exactly. So, so I would think that this, that this movement, in order to fight this enemy, needs the spirit of prophecy. And, and what did um, Parminder do with the spirit of prophecy to counteract that light? started tearing it down. Uh, he seemed to, yeah, he was inserting a lot of his own stuff in there. See, I left the Catholic Church totally when I was 14. I'm just thinking back to 
the convent schools and the Jesuit sermons. I don't recall much of them. I remember some statements that really stood out. I remember, you know, some, you know, talking and being with some of these people. But I mean, to me, it was like enforced conformity, as you said. We had to recite the, you know, the role of the bishop and and what confirmation meant and all of, uh, you know the catechism and all of these rote prayers mm-hmm. and penances and it was yeah I, I I think I closed down a lot to it but still it's it bothers me because it it has to be there because I wouldn't have reacted to to what you were saying toward the end there with 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 that article I thought yeah that's exactly what they were doing they just didn't call it spiritual formation. Right. Yeah. So, so now Deborah, of course, I mean, we're not saying that this is Ellen White as a person. It has to do with the message that comes from the spirit of prophecy, which is the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, which is also of the message of the Holy Spirit as well. Right. And is it true that she judges Israel? at this time yes yeah because that's basically um that's the judge that we are under as seventh-day adventists wouldn't we put ellen white as a judge or her message as a judge amen she always said let the word of god be your counselor yeah okay Now it says she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So what is this saying about this judge, Deborah? What are the symbols here? And this is where we're going to probably have to finish, uh, you know, start again uh, tomorrow. Um, there's a whole bunch here. Uh, but, and she's going to send and call Barak, the son of Vinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali. So, so we, we know that it has something to do with Ellen White's message, the spirit of prophecy. Um, then there's some interesting things here, I think, uh, that we haven't noticed. Okay, there's so, okay, Dwight? There's a lot of points within this that, especially symbolically, that we have yet to address. Yeah, I know. Okay, so she's going to dwell between two places, Ramah and Bethel. So we know Bethel's the house of God. Rama means a height or a high place or a hill. And uh, there's four different places, but it's really the, the one that would be referred to here. Um, I think would be the first one in on my Bible here, the, the town in Benjamin on the border of Ephraim. I think so, but I, I'd have to look into this a bit more. Um, but isn't, isn't Rama also... <laughs> Samuel. What's that? Isn't that isn't Rama also where Samuel dwelt? Yeah, I'm just not sure which um, which Rama it is because there's four different places. Right. Rama, which is Ramoth Gilead. Um, it's a landmark on the boundary of Asher, apparently between Tyre and Zidon. So that's obviously not this one. A fortified city in Naphtali. That might be it. Or a place of Sam, the home place of Samuel, located in the hill country of Ephraim, or a town in Benjamin on the border of Ephraim, about five miles from Jerusalem and near near to Gibeah. So, so I'd have to look into that. I'm not sure which Rama it is, well, but she's definitely. dwelling between two different places, a height and um, and a church. Now, if you look at a height, if it's a fortification. And a church, what is that? 
what two symbols would Rama and Bethel represent? What what would anybody have an idea on that? Would this be church and state? That could be one way of looking at it, but the other way, when we're dealing with height and the house of God, mm -hmm. isn't isn't Mount Sinai looked upon as being the height where God gave His law? Yeah. But here, if this is Rama, this wouldn't be Mount Zion. This would be a fortified city, which would be more about military or the state. Bethel being the house of God. But, but yeah, possibly. So we have to look at this a bit more. Uh, the palm tree. So she dwells under this palm tree. So we'd have to understand that symbol. So there's lots of things. And, and them coming up to her for judgment, what that means specifically, and then her call for Barak. So, so anyway, it, our time is up, but almost. A any final thoughts on this? I mean, I know that this is, um, we haven't pulled everything together yet, but we should be able to see that this is specifically about this movement and our dependence upon the spirit of prophecy to counteract this. And Parminder, I asked the question, what did he do to uh, basically uh, counteract the spirit of prophecy? And that was dispensationalism. So now he can pick and choose which statements in the spirit of prophecy he wants. And this is exactly like my dad growing up, deciding that he can choose what he wants from the Bible but the other things he can just reject. And it's a dispensational argument that is where we're more enlightened now. We live in a, a different time. And so those things in the Bible uh, don't apply to us or those things in the spirit of prophecy don't apply to us anymore. And we can actually see them as error. And yet we can still read the Bible or the spirit of prophecy when it suits our purposes. And this is, of course, a denial of the spirit of prophecy altogether. And I see it happening in Adventism amongst all different types of groups, whether they're conservatives or liberals. They pick and choose what they want to, uh, what they want from the spirit of prophecy. So they, you know, for instance, even many conservative Adventists don't accept Ellen White's chronology. And that is very sad. Yeah, and it's like, okay, so you take a statement from Willie White where he's talking about the book, The Great Controversy, where Ellen White in the introduction says that she used the dates from common history and she didn't try to correct she's just quoting sources it doesn't mean that she accepts everything those sources say you can't then take that and apply it to everything that she wrote where she's talking about chronology because that's not what she's saying she's not saying i did this everywhere in my writings she says i did this in the book the great controversy I just quote the sources for this historical information. So, so I, I, you know, that that misuse of spirit of prophecy, but also the idea of dispensationalism, uh, it to me is such, oh, it's such a dangerous idea. Um. And, and I don't see how somebody could be a Christian if they take that position. It it means, uh, you know, for instance, uh, my brother-in-law, when, when he married my sister, um, she was at that time going to the United Church of Canada, and, and he wasn't a Christian at all. 
and uh, so he started going to the United Church. Uh, they both at, are Adventists now, but um, at that time, he went to one of their men's conferences, and and even though he knew little about the Bible, the one thing he knew is that what they were saying was incorrect. And the thing that they were saying is that Jesus today is different than the Jesus of the of the Bible. And and he knew enough to know that God does not change. But this is how many people look at it. Somehow that God has changed. That is, we've modified God so that he's like the God we want him to be, based upon fashion, based upon the, the, the values of the world. And wouldn't that be dispensationalism? Very likely. So if, if you have Paul condemning homosexuality, the only way you can get rid of his statement so that you can accept homosexuality is to use the dispensational argument that Paul was speaking for his day based on the values of his day, but we need to understand the truth based upon the our day. And of course, the Bible tells us what the values of our day are. What are they? What are the values that are going to be in the last days? They're going to be the same values as, as were occurring before the flood. Yes, and in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. So if we follow that dispensationalist principle, Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed was unjust. The world being destroyed by the flood was unjust. So, so you can see the dangers. So this is what you know we have to understand about Parminder's message, but also to understand how we're infected by it. Because it doesn't always manifest itself in exactly the same way. And, and then we're going to have to be able to try to put this up on a line. And it's still going to take us time. I don't think this is a, a simple task that we have before us right now. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Let's uh, close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the way that you bless in our studies we know, Lord, that there's much we do not understand. And um, we just ask that we can uh, continue to open your word together each morning and also on our own to study your word. And uh, we thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.